Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the GCA Church this morning. Before we start off today, can everybody please stand up and greet uh, your people, the people around you with a handshake or a hug? Okay, for our announcements now, uh, this Wednesday, April 17th, uh, the Kobo 8th grade class will have a pancake breakfast from 7.30 to 8 a.m. at the Kobo gym. Come by to support the 8th grade class. For prices and more details and to order, please visit the GCA Church website event page for the link. A Night of Hope is a family-friendly concert that will be happening on April 19th and will be featuring Brandon Heath and other local worship musicians. The event's purpose is to unite our regional faith community together and reflect on how God is moving across northwest Georgia. Our next soup kitchen is going to be on April 20th. You can help with purchasing ingredients, prepping, cooking, or delivering. Please sign up through our website and event page. On Friday, April 26th, we're going to have our Asian Heritage Vespers, where we come together to celebrate Asian and Pacific Islander history and culture. On April 27th at 11 a.m., we're going to have our annual spring program. We're excited to see what our music department has put together for this special service. Now I'd like to invite Chaplain Josh for a couple more announcements. All right. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Um, just wanted to to make a couple of announcements. I know there was a, a message that accidentally went out this week uh, regarding uh, senior potluck, I believe. Is that correct? I think that went out. Well, I'm sorry to inform. There is no senior potluck today, but seniors, you are always welcome to go to the calf. So let's, let's, let's give a round of applause for that. Thank you, yes. <laughs> I just wanted to make a quick announcement um, on April 28th, the Georgia Cumberland Conference is doing an Atlanta Braves game day um, where they have reserved a, a whole block of tickets for the Atlanta Braves game. It's a Sunday game, and um, it's the Braves, so it's amazing. Um, <clears throat> we have ordered, GCA ordered 30 tickets, and so far we have about 23 or so who have signed up and are planning on going. And so I just wanted to throw out the invite to the whole church body. If you are interested in joining us, uh, please come talk to me after church or just send me a message and uh, we can make that arrangement. So um, I think it's going to be a fun day. It's going to be a day where we kind of uh, just go to a game with our, with our entire conference. And I think it's going to be lots of fun. So if you're interested, please come talk to me or send me a message. Um, at this time... Uh, Uncle Doug is going to share with us a children's story, and um, so I want to invite all the kids to look around, maybe find a $1 bill or a $2 bill or, or a $100 bill, 
um, and bring that on up, and uh, it's time for children's stories, so please come on down. I think that's about it. Um, yeah, but will you, will you move the church so it doesn't get in the way? Boys and girls, good morning and happy Sabbath. I'm so glad you guys are here today. My favorite part of the week is Sabbath. My favorite part of Sabbath is church, and my favorite part about church is the children's story. Yes, I love children's stories. I love, I love listening to children's story. I love doing children's stories. I love being close to children's stories because they're my favorite. And today's children's story is even better because it's from the Bible. Yes. It's a Bible yes. story. It's from Bible Luke story. 15. Okay. okay. Where's the story found? Luke 15. Oh, In fact, good, good. you know, today's story is even, it's even better than normal because it's not just one story. It's one. three different Ooh, stories. Luke 15 story. has one. three Ooh, stories. Okay. Okay. And we're going to tell all three of those stories now. And yes. it's cool because all three stories are about kind of about the same thing. They're about something mm. that's lost. There's Ooh. a lost son. There's a lost coin. Mm -hmm. And there's a lost lamb. Ooh. Did you say lamb? I said a lamb, like, like a sheep, oh. a baby sheep. Well, yeah, great, great, great thing that, that you said lamb because I brought my little lamb. <laughs> you brought a yeah. lamb with you to Mr. church Fluffy. today? I've had him since I was a baby, and I... I I actually still sleep with him at night. So you brought yeah. Mr. Fluffy with you today. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. Well, you guys, let's use Mr. Fluffy in oh, our story. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, stay right here for a second. Okay. Um, put All on the right. space helmet. Wait, uh, what's the uh, the solar? Yeah, I'm going to take was, Mr. Fluffy. Uh, earlier this week, while I, he can't see anything, where's my lamb? He gets anxious. Mr. Fluffy me. is going to go uh, hide somewhere. Uh, who there we go. Thank Where's you for helping my, out. My, my little okay, lamb. Let, uh, ready? I let's take off this helmet. I, oh, oh. Okay, oh. now we're going to tell the story. Um, Once where, upon a time, where, there was a shepherd who had a lamb, Fluffy? and the lamb uh, was lost, oh, and he Mr. didn't know Fluffy's what to lost. do. Where, have you seen Mr. Fluffy? Mr. Fluffy? He, went cra he was so you? scared oh, that he Fluffy. went everywhere where, to try where? to find it. Uh, Mr. Fluffy. Well, you guys, will you help him find it? Wait, Maybe um, wait, how about, wait. How, wait, they're how pointing. About, you're, you're pointing, okay. How about, how, we do, how about we do hot and cold so you okay, can help me let's find Let's do hot and cold. Okay. Tell him if he's hotter uh, or colder. Cold? Cold? Okay. Uh, warmer? Warm? Warm? <gasps> oh, Mr. Fluffy! Yes, yes, Mr. Fluffy. Look how happy yes. he is. <gasps> Did you see how happy he was? Are you and okay? When, when he first oh. found out that Mr. Fluffy was, was missing, he was scared to oh, death. He wanted to do Andrew. everything he could to find right Mr. There. Fluffy. Oh. Well, that's one story, oh. but there's, there's another story in Luke 15 oh, about a woman who lost a coin. Oh, 
Did you say coin? I said I said coin. Well, it just so happens that I have my lucky coin with me. You have a lucky yep. coin? Do you carry you carry oh, Mr. Fluffy yeah, and a lucky the, coin with you every day? Yeah, I don't leave the house with it. So it's right well, here. Well, lucky. let's make this coin part of the story. Shiny. Here. We're gonna so, have you put yeah, on this gonna, special yep, space helmet. No, not again. No way. Wait. No, I I I I need it. If I, if I don't have In it, I'll, Luke 15, I'll trip, I'll trip on the there was a story about a woman who had 10 coins backwards. and she lost one coin and she couldn't find it. And so <laughs> his coin is lost. Where's my, where's my coin? I don't have your coin. My, I don't have your coin. Uh, you, it's not in my pocket. Oh, where's my coin? Is Look it, how nervous maybe, he is. Maybe, maybe if I do the coin trick. No. Do you see how scared he is? He's doing everything oh he can God. to find that coin. <laughs> you? Hmm. Okay. Hey, you guys, will right. you give him a hand? Help him out. I'm cold. I'm cold. Okay. Okay. Hmm. He's All getting right. warmer. He's getting warmer. Warm? Uh, cold? I'm cold. He's getting warmer. Warmer. Ooh! Yes! He <laughs> found it! I found you! <gasps> <gasps> See how excited Ooh. he is about finding his coin? Oh, That's coin. just like in Luke 15 when the woman <sighs> found her coin. She even had a party. She was so excited about finding that coin. <sighs> okay, that's two stories in Luke 15, but the third story oh, more. That's is right. even better. The third story is not a coin. It's not a lamb. It's a lost son. Ooh, now we can I have someone that is like a son to me. Who's somebody like a son to you? Um, Andrew Mercado. Andrew is like a son. Yeah. They're really, they're really close friends, What's and they, and he looks up to him, and he takes care of him, and they're really close, and we could use Andrew yeah. to be a lost son. Great, yeah. Uh, I'm tired of being here, Dean Albert. I'm, I'm done. He doesn't want to be here anymore. Oh, he doesn't. What? That's so sad. Well, 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 maybe this is part of the story. Uh, there was a man whose son was missing. And then as oh. soon as he saw that his son was missing, you know what he did? Uh, I mean. Uh, Why are you just standing here? Well, I, he, he just left. Well, you ran after the sheep. But, and you ran but, after the coin. But, Why aren't you running after your son? He looked like he didn't want to be found, though. Oh, I he mean, doesn't want to be found? Yeah, I mean, I, I love him as a son, so I'll, I'll respect his decision. If he doesn't want to be found. Oh, that's so. really sad. But that's yeah, something. I mean, Even though you can see him, yeah, but, you're but, still but, standing. But uh -huh. if he ever decides to come back home, I will be so joyful. I'll even give him a big bear hug. I'll run up to him and bear hug him real tight. You know, I think yeah. that's what actually happened in Luke 15. So I'll do this, that. Hey, he's coming back. Look like he's coming back. <laughs> Andrew? He's actually. Here, hold this. Ah. Uh. Oh, he's even taking his coat off and giving it to his son. Oh, that's beautiful. He was lost as a son, and he's found again. And Dean Albert is so happy. You guys, all three stories in Luke 15 are kind of the same. All of them are about you. You are the lost lamb that the shepherd wanted to find. You are the lost coin that the woman did everything she could to find it. And you are the lost son or the lost daughter, the lost child that his father wants to do everything he can to find his son. He wants to do anything he can to get his son to come home. You could see how excited Dean Albert was. You can't even imagine how excited God is when somebody who's lost is found. Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear God, Thank you for loving us so much that you will do anything you can to find us when we are lost. And if we are the lost son, help us to decide that we want to be found. In your name we pray. Amen. You can go back to your seats.
Good morning again. Um, as you can tell, we are going to do Meet the Family this morning. We're not meeting a family, but we're meeting a, a student uh, here at GCA. Uh, you could also probably tell that I'm not Maddie Zinke. Uh, she texted me this morning and had a, a fever of 101.2, so uh, p- please pray for her as she's not feeling well this morning. But, but I get the privilege to talk to one of our students here at GCA. Um, so please, I know, that, uh, I know that a lot of students know you, Isabel, um, but maybe some of the congregation, they don't know you as well. Could you please just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are? Um, hi, my name is Isabel Adibia. And I am a sophomore here at GCA. All right, GCA. Now, have you, you, you did not come at the beginning of the year. When did you come here to GCA? Uh, so I got here in February. So I'm almost at my second month here at GCA. So that's exciting. All right, so you came in February. Like, how did you, how did you arrive here on campus? Like, what brought you to GCA? Uh, so when I was looking for schools like here in America, I wasn't specifically looking for a Seventh-day Adventist school, I'll be honest. But then I saw GCA and I don't know, I just, I felt like I was being led here in a way. And ever since I've been here, I haven't felt this close to God, like ever. Amen. Amen. So, so I just got to ask, you were just Googling and like, how did you hear about GCA or... I was honestly just Googling. I was just like, boarding schools in America, and yeah. So amen, <laughs> amen. That is awesome. <clears throat> so obviously, um, when, when we talked to you, when I talked to you for the very first time, immediately we noticed that you have an accent that is very interesting. That was pretty good, right? That was pretty good. <laughs> so tell us i mean where where were you born where are you from how did you how did you pick up this this accent that's so awesome okay so i was actually born in america i was born in california but i was raised in nigeria so i was brought up in nigeria both my parents are nigerian and i went to school in england for almost two years and people my age in nigeria for some reason they have an accent which i don't know because that's not like a nigerian accent and um in england as well so i developed the accent in england but I'm not British. I just have an accent. So yeah. All right. Well, I think it's it's really cool. So, um, so I mean, so you you've lived in England for the last how many years? I Two? don't live in England. You? I still live in Nigeria. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, how how did how what's it been like for you to move to Georgia? I mean, how do you like Georgia? Because that's obviously different. Okay. Oh my days. So, um, <laughs> um, it's very different, specifically in like the way, like the dialogue, like not the dialogue, but like words are very different. Like I say a lot of stuff differently and my friends look at me like I'm from another planet, like literally. Like you guys say aluminum and I say aluminum and I don't measure weight in pounds, I measure in kilograms and I don't use Fahrenheit, I use Celsius. So like every time anyone's ever talking about this stuff, I'm like, I'm so lost, literally. And like I say jumper instead of like sweatshirt or like sweater or something. So I think just like the way I speak is like very different. So I think that's like the most change that I'm experiencing, yeah. All right, so um, just tell us like, what are you, what are your hobbies? Like when you're back home, like what are, what is, what are are some of the favorite things that you like to do back home? Um, So I'm an actress in Nigeria, so I really like to act. So when I'm home, I'd like, you know, I do, I take like acting programs at home and stuff. And I'm a very social person, so like I'm never ever in my house. I'm always out with family, or I'm out with friends. Like I, I don't like staying in one place, basically. And I just like being around people. So I'm just always active and I'm just out and about when I'm at home. So yeah. Awesome. And last but certainly not least, tell us, um, please share with us your favorite Bible verse. I know you had one. Um, so could you please share? So my favorite Bible verse is Matthew 6, chapter 25. I mean, Matthew 6, verse 25, it tells you, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear, for his life not more than clothes, and the, for his life not more than food, and the body more than clothes. And I feel like this Bible verse really resonates with me, because I'm someone who cares a lot about what, uh, what other people think of me, what other people think of me, and I feel like I can be very insecure and, like, self-conscious at times, and I feel like this Bible verse It's just God telling me, like, my child, like, don't worry about what all these people are saying because you know that's not you. And, like, 
he's kind of telling me that there's no need for me to feel this way. And I feel like it just really speaks to me. So. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Well, we are so glad that you're at GCA and we welcome you as a family here into the GCA church. Obviously, you're, this, is a, this can be your home away from home. Um, and before we send you off, I'd like to have a prayer with you. So let's bow our heads as we pray. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so, so much for GCA um, and for this church, Lord. We thank you so much that we've had the ability to get to know Isabel a little bit today. Uh, Lord, I believe it was not an accident that she is here at, at this school and she's here up on this stage today. We're so thankful for the way that you've led in her lives through the Google search to bring her to Calhoun, Georgia, right? Uh, so we're just so grateful to get to know her. And I just pray a blessing on her life, Lord. I pray a blessing on her family back, um, back home. And I just want to pray that, that she would be able to finish this year off strong and, and, uh, and just may she continue to grow closer each and every day as a, real, as a result of being here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> at, before we get into our praise set, I just wanted to also take a second to introduce our week of prayer speaker. Um, you don't need to come up. He's going to come up and preach at us here in just a few minutes. But Pastor Chris uh, is a friend of mine from back in seminary. Um, we took a couple of classes together. And as I said to the students earlier, we connected over football. Um, he's a Packers fan, and they win a lot more than the Falcons. Um, but we still, we still were able to connect over that. And, and Pastor Chris is one of those people that um, from the moment I met him, you could just tell he was real, right? You could just tell that he loved the Lord, and, and I could tell that he was, he was good people um, early on. And so uh, we invited him here. He's been sharing the word this week and just doing an amazing job. And he's currently pastoring out in Portland, Oregon at Rock Fellowship uh, SDA Church. And Pastor Chris, we have been blessed. I know I've said this. I can't say it enough. We've been blessed to have you here this week. It's been great to connect with you again, and um, we're looking forward to you uh, sharing the word with us today. So thank you so much for being here at the GCA Church and at GCA and ministering to our kids in our community this week. So thank you. Yeah. Good morning, guys, and happy Sabbath. Um, please stand with us as we sing. Your mercy never fails me, and all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, and I will sing of the goodness of God. the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, and I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after It's running after Oh, my life you have been fed. 
will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. God's love is really special. It's unconditional, and that means that even though we mess up every day, he still calls us back to him. So as we sing this next song, I want us to remember everything that he's done for us, how much he loves us, and what he's going to continue to do for us in our lives. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No.
I invite you all to kneel as we're about to pray.
dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for blessing us and keeping us. Please continue to bless us. Help us bless one another. Please let us take what Pastor Chris says and apply it to our lives. Let us let us meditate on your words and allow us to be more and more like you day by day. Please bless us and keep us, um, keep us, keep us patient and 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 honest and true. Make us more and more like you. In your whole name, we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath and good morning, everybody. Man, so good to see you guys. It's been an amazing week for me here at GCA. Um, the students, you guys are awesome. Teachers, the ones that I've met, you guys are amazing. Um, I'm so grateful for, uh, for Chaplain Josh. Um, it was great uh, when I got to get to know him during seminary. Um, we just clicked right away, and he's like such a great person to just talk to and just an easy person to, to love. So... Um, I just want you to know how, how lucky you are and blessed you are to have Chaplain Josh here at this school as well. Um, this past week, we've been focusing on the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son. We've been looking at it from a deeper and richer perspective, though. It's not just about the, the general story and what happened, but we've been looking at the meaning and the point of the story. And the point that I've been trying to make is that the point of the story is not just the younger son. And the point of the story is not just the older brother. And the point of the story is not just the father who is loving and kind and willing to accept. Like th Those are great parts of the story, but that's actually not the main point of the story. Jesus has a deeper plan and deeper meaning behind the story. The point, as I've been explaining it, is that the point is that both ways lead to emptiness. Both ways of life lead to emptiness. The way that the brothers represent two different ways of life. The younger brother represents a way of life that we've called self-discovery. It's this idea that my path to happiness is really me being me. And the things that are causing me to not be happy are people putting expectations on me and keeping me from being who I am, who I really am, what I really want to do. The other way of life we call moral conformity, and that's what the older brother represents. And it's a life of, okay, if I'm good and I do the right things and I do well in school and I stay in church and, 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 and I'm righteous and holy, do all that stuff, one day I'm going to have everything I need. I'm going to achieve what we've been calling the Christian American Adventist dream, that one day I'll have money, I'll have church, and I'll have family, and then I'll be happy. But we talked about how both ways of life actually lead to emptiness. Even the one where it's about moral conformity and be good, that also can lead to emptiness. But the reason why is this. The re reason why is that relationships characterized by self-centered consumerism and control are always empty. Both ways of life lead to a relationship with God where either you are the center and you're trying to get things from God, the path of self-discovery is about what can God give me, give me all the things. The path of the older brother of moral conformity is let me be good and do the right thing, then God should bless me and give me happiness and give me all the things that I want. Relationships where it's about self-centered consumerism, what can I get, or control or manipulation, those relationships are always empty. And so I've been challenging us to choose a third way, not the way of self-discovery or moral conformity, but a third way, which I call the way of trust. And it will come, what it comes down to is believing this statement, that you trust that what your heavenly father wants for you is only your deepest happiness. 
your deepest, deepest happiness in the depths of your being. That that's what God, that's what Jesus truly wants for you. And last night we talked about if you choose the way of trust, what is the first thing that God wants to do in your life? And it's that he wants to help you rediscover your identity. Because the, the younger brother, he had a sense of an identity when he was talking about his plan, he believed that he was no longer worthy to be a son. But the father, when he approached him, he says, no, 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 you're my son still. Even to the older brother who was angry and accusatory and was so mean to the father, he calls him my dear son. Even though he did not feel he was a son, instead he felt like he was a slave to the father. So one of the first things that Jesus wants to do with you when you choose the way of trust and a life with him is reestablish your identity, help you understand who you are in Christ. Now today, for this, for this worship, for this morning, I want to turn our attention to the Father. Let's look at the Father. We haven't really talked about the Father this whole week. But let's look at the Father and the kind of Father we see in this story. But I also want to ask an interesting question. In the story of the prodigal son... Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus in the story of the prodigal son? Now, at first you're like, he's telling the story. He's not in the story. But I want to make a, I want to argue that he actually is in the story. He is in the experience of the story. So we're going to deal with those two things. We're going to look to the father, look at the father, and then we're going to answer the question, where is Jesus in the story? Can you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you so much for this wonderful week here at GCA. We thank you for the blessings. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving the way you've moved every night. Lord, I thank you so much for what you're doing. But God, as we conclude, I pray that your spirit would be present deeply right now, Father. And that you would help us, Lord, to hear your voice. And you would do what only you can do, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. So I want to turn our attention to what the Father does. Let's look at Luke chapter 15. Verse 20. This is when the younger brother comes back to the father. This is the story. So he got up. He is the younger brother. He got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now what's interesting about this phrase here where it says, while he was still a long way off... Let me show you the literal translation of that little phrase. It actually is, while he was still far being distant. Which is a weird way to say things, isn't it? If someone were to talk to you like that, you'd think that was odd. Because there's too much repetition. Obviously, if you're still far, you're also distant. Why repeat? Well, in scripture, repetition means emphasis. If something in the language is repeated, and it sounds weird for us, but it's repeated, it means that the writer or the storyteller is emphasizing that point. So what he's saying here, what Jesus is saying is the distance was really, really, really great. He was really far, is what Jesus is trying to say here. In the, the King James Version, it says a great distance away. But what does that mean? Why is that detail significant? This detail is so significant because you have to understand, the, what's the only way you can see something very, 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 very far away? What's the only way you can see something that is still far being distant? The only way you can see something so far is you have to be looking for it, right? You can't see something distant out of your peripheral vision. You can't see it at the corner of your eye. You can't see someone a mile off from the corner of your eye. No, no. You can see a, a short distance, people maybe in this room in the corner of your eye. But you can't see someone a far distance unless your eyes and your head and your body are facing direct that direction unless you are looking for it. You see, the father did not just go about his business after his son left. He wasn't like, after that conversation, he wasn't like, Oh, well, that was, that was bad. Okay, well, I got stuff to do. After his son left, he didn't go about business as usual. He didn't just move on with his life. No, the story indicates that every day this father waited and looked down the road at a far distance, hoping that his son would return. 
You know, it wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't like the father was working and farming and out of the corner of his eye, he's like, what's that little smudge over there? What's that little dot over there? Oh, it's actually my son. Fantastic. No, this story presents a father who waited and looked down the road, and that's like all he did. And he was just focused on that road, hoping to see his son return. And for any one of you who are at a place in your life where you feel distant from God, I want you to hear that. If you feel like you're not close to God or you, you, maybe you've been close to God in the past, but for some reason in this time of life, you're struggling and you have doubts, you don't sense his spirit, you don't hear his voice or whatever you have used in the past to help you understand that you are close. If you don't have that anymore and you feel you're distant, I want you to know this is the posture that God has towards you. He has not turned his back on you. He is not going about his other business. He's not busy running the universe. He is looking and waiting and longing for you. His eyes and attention are focused on you if you feel distant from God. Right now, in this moment, he's looking for you. Some of you guys, right now, he's looking at you, waiting and longing and hoping that this is the moment that you will return. This is the posture of the father. But now let's look at the older brother. The older brother doesn't want to come to the house at the end of the story. He's angry. He's upset. He's complaining. He's accusing. Doing all these terrible things. So much bitterness. So much resentment. Now let's look at the story. How does Jesus respond? Or not Jesus, the father. Luke 15. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So what did the father do? The father went out and pleaded with him. He did not have to do this. Like how many of you guys love to talk to people who are angry and bitter and resentful and hate you? Like you don't want to talk to them. You want to avoid them. We don't like that drama. Who wants to bring that drama into their life? But the father is in the house. He hears that the brother won't come in. He doesn't sit there saying, well, he better. Well, he better come in. He better figure this out. I'm waiting. I'm not going to go there. Why should I go there? I'm the one in the right. He's wrong. He should come in. He hears that his older son would not come in, so he goes out and pleads with him. Like, look at the, this intentional, active nature of this father who is going forward and reaching out. He's always moving first in this story. The father is always moving first. It's not the sons. It's, not, it's the father who's going out. Now, in this story, he doesn't go out to embrace him, does he? He goes out to talk to him, to comfort him, to reason with him, and to convince him to come into the house. And this tells us actually really, really import something important about spiritual change. Like if you are struggling with something or you feel distant from God, this is really, really important. It's that spiritual change actually doesn't begin with you. Like you don't, you and I don't have the power and the willpower and the strength of mind to change ourselves. It, that's not how it works. Spiritual change begins with the Father. Spiritual change begins with the Father looking for you and walking to you and coming to you or running to you. That's where any kind of change begins. So if you are seeking change, invite the Father in. That's where it all begins. It's not like you can just will yourself into healing. You can't just force yourself out of addiction and bad habits. It begins, change begins with a father who is looking for you and who runs, with a father who runs to his children. But also what's really important to understand about the father is he approaches the sons very differently. With the younger son, it's this dramatic, like, wonderful image, right? And you can imagine, like, there's music playing, there's a soundtrack, it's beautiful, and he's running to his son, and they hug, and it's wonderful, and it's so, so emotional, but then with the other son, it's not like that. With the other son, it's quiet, and it's patient, and it's slower. See, some of us, many of us, we want the younger son experience, where God's love just overwhelms us, and it just overflows, and it's like this big, dramatic moment. And I hope that we all have those moments in our lives. But the truth is sometimes God's, God's movement towards you is more like the younger brother where it's slow, it's patient, 
It's quiet and it's gentle. And it's this just simple invitation to come in. I believe this week God has been moving among the students and the faculty and the people who have joined us this week. Like if you have had a moment stirred in any way, like I want you guys to understand the reality. Or, or, or right now as we're talking, if you have any moment or any worship service or camp meeting or whatever where your heart felt stirred in some way, that was the Father moving towards you. Like that wasn't just you, okay? That wasn't just like, oh, you realize something because you're so smart. No, 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 no. If you felt a stirring in your heart, if you felt something click in your mind, that was the Holy Spirit reaching for you. And so if any of you guys this week have felt that, if you felt any kind of conviction stirring, I want you guys to know what has been happening. From a spiritual perspective, the Father has been reaching and walking towards you, inviting you in. Isn't that awesome? That is so cool. Like, that's actually what's happening this week. So that's the Father. This is why I say that the accusations the older brother has are completely false. Because this is the spirit and the character and the personality of the father. He's one who looks and longs for his children. He's not just going to sit back and, and move on with his life. No, he moves and he runs and he looks and he gently moves and walks and invites. And that's, that's who the father is. Now, I'm really grateful for the children's story because you guys um, just showed us the story like straight through and you guys gave us an example to look at. And this is actually really perfect for this next part of the message where we ask the question, where's Jesus in the story? And by the way, this is one of my favorite parts of this message and like this whole series is this. Where is Jesus in the story? So we didn't really talk about this, but this story is a part of a trilogy, right? And the children's story showed this. The trilogy, it's the lost sheep, it's the lost coin, and the lost son. Now, because of the children's story, I don't have to rehash the whole story, but generally you guys know, right? Someone loses a sheep, shepherds go for it. Someone loses a coin, someone loses a son. And then at the end of it, there's always a celebration. Okay, so that's what's similar. Let me ask you this question. Think about this. What's different about the last story as compared to the first two stories? There's something in the story of the lost son that is different than what happens in the lost sheep and the lost coin. There's something that the lost sheep and lost coin have in common, and it do, they don't have it in the story of the lost son. What is it? So in the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin, the sheep gets lost. So what happens? The shepherd goes to look for the sheep. In the story of the lost coin, the coin is missing, so the woman goes and looks all over for the coin. What's missing in the third story? In the lost son, the son goes away, and nobody goes to look for him. Interesting. Why is it? Because if you were listening to this story, if you were listening to this parable when Jesus was talking, you would assume that the pattern would continue, wouldn't you? Lost thing, the person goes. Lost coin, the person goes. Lost son, the person goes. But there's nobody who goes after the son. The, origin, the original audience would have expected someone to go look for the son. Someone to go out and follow him to convince him. Someone to go out and find him and bring him back home. But there's nobody in the story who does that. Who's supposed to do that is the question. Is it the father? Is it the mother? Is it the brother? Is it the servants? Who's supposed to bring the younger son back? How come no one went to go look for him? There's a verse in Genesis that I think helps us answer the question. When Cain kills Abel, God approaches Cain and he asks him this question. Where is your brother Abel? And then what does Cain say? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The implied answer to that question, we don't get it, but what's the implied answer? Yes, Cain, you are. You're supposed to take care of your brother. You actually are, as the older brother, you are the keeper of the younger brother. So in this story, the story of the lost son, the older brother should have gone after the son, but he doesn't. In this story, the, 
the older brother, if he was a faithful, true older brother, he should have gone to rescue the younger brother. He should have gone and brought him back. This is actually where Jesus is in the story. And it's kind of a trick question because he's like not in this story, but he's kind of in the story. See, when the listeners heard this, they would be thinking, why isn't the brother going out? That's where Jesus is. Jesus is in that question. When the listeners were like, why didn't he go? Someone should have gone. That's where Jesus was. Jesus is in the logical next question that they would naturally be answering. Why didn't he go? Who should go? And Jesus is standing there telling the story. So here's my point. Jesus' presence is in the absence of a faithful older brother. They would have been like, oh, that brother's terrible. That brother's bad. That brother's not doing the right thing. And Jesus is standing there, and he's trying to get them to understand, hey, you actually have a faithful, true older brother. Even though this guy was not faithful, I want you to understand that you do have a faithful brother. A true faithful brother would have gone out, but this guy doesn't. So here's the other question. Why not? Why didn't, the, why didn't the older brother care? Why didn't the older brother go out and do the things that he was supposed to do? So some scholars say, some scholars say that the reason he didn't go is that it would have been too expensive for him to go. It costs too much money for him to go. See, remember, in this story, the father divides up his wealth. And we talked about this last night. His older brother was not willing to pay the cost. In Luke 15, verse 12, sorry, let's go back. In Luke 15, verse 12, it talks about how he divided his wealth among the, the both of his sons. So the younger son and the older son both got their wealth. Any expenses, any costs that he had to pay to find his brother, any debts the brother incurred, the, the brother would have had to pay. And scholars believe, like they're saying, his older brother was not willing to pay the cost. He's like, "Ah, it's too much for me. That celebration, that feast, and that party, it's actually the brother paying for it because it's all his now, you know? He was not willing to pay the cost. So here's what I want to share with you guys. Your older brother was willing to pay the cost. Each of you. All of us have a faithful and true older brother who was willing to pay the cost to rescue you. That's where Jesus is in the story. We have an older brother who wouldn't just travel to another country to find us. We have an older brother who would travel from heaven to earth to find us across time and space. We have an older brother that would pay anything, sacrifice anything, even his own life, and pay the ultimate cost to rescue you. That's where he is in the story. He's the faithful older brother that we all need and that we all can have. You know, what's interesting is that when the older brother, uh, when the younger brother asked for uh, all the, the money and the wealth and stuff, this is what it says. Father, give me my share of the estate. And he says, so he divided his property between them. Here's what's really interesting about the language here. He divided his property. The word property here. In Greek is the word bios. He divided his bios. What does that mean? What's, what study do we get that comes from the word bios? Biology, which is the study of life. So when he says that he, he shared and distributed his property, it's saying that he gave up his life. Because remember, his property wasn't, or his his money and wealth wasn't in cash, it was in land. So he had to go and sell land everywhere. And he was tearing up, so to speak, breaking up, tearing up his own life to give it to his son. For his son, for his lost son, he divided, tore up, broke up his own life to give this to his son. You and I have a father who is looking for us, who is waiting for us and longing to bring us back home. We have a father who would be willing to break up and tear up his own life for you. And then we have a faithful older brother who would be willing to pay any cost to rescue you and bring you home. This is where Jesus is in the story. This is why the way of trust leads to our deepest fulfillment and joy and happiness. 
because it's rooted in this kind of love. You see, the way of the brother and the way of the, the, way of the older brother and the way of the younger brother are rooted in control, selfishness, manipulation. That's why it leads to emptiness. But this way, the way of trust is rooted in the deepest love the world, the universe has ever seen. This is why in this relationship, it can provide the satisfaction and fulfillment that we all long for. That's why we're, this is where we can find the peace and the contentment that we've all longed for. This is where we can find the identity that is true to us, who we truly are. It's because it's rooted in the Father's love for his children. It's rooted in the love of the Father and of a brother who runs to you and is willing to pay any cost to bring you home. It does not require control or manipulation because our fa Heavenly Father has already given us everything, guys. You know, my, my goal and my hope at the end of this week is for you to all be able to say to God, I don't want your stuff, I just want you. Remember, that was what it was really about for the brothers. I don't want you, Father, I want your stuff. I'm hoping that today and this week we will be moving towards a place where we say, God, I don't want your stuff. I don't need your stuff. I don't need the blessings. I just want you. Because in you is that love that I long for. In you is that identity that is true to me. In you is hope and peace and love. I shared in some of the classes one of my favorite verses, and it's this, Romans 8, 32. This verse, um, it doesn't get a lot of hype. Because the verse right before it is really, really popular. If God is for us, who can get, be against us? And everyone's like, yeah, that's a great verse. But this verse right afterwards, really meaningful for me. Listen to what it says. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Like God wants to give you everything. He wants to give you everything. Do you trust this is my question. Do you trust that this is true? That the father who gave up his own son, the brother who gave up his own life, does he not also want to give you everything? Does he not want your deepest fulfillment and joy and happiness? But it comes not by asking for his stuff. It comes by asking for his relationship. It comes by asking for his presence in our lives. I hope we can say, God, I don't need your stuff. I just want Every day, your father runs to you. Every morning, your father runs to you. And my hope and my prayer as we conclude today and this week is that today and tomorrow and the next week and every day after that, that you would run to him. That you would see your father running to you and in kind you would run to him and welcome his embrace and welcome his presence in your life. That we would choose a life of trust, and like the brothers did at the end of the story, that we could all enter that feast. That we could all enter that celebration, and we can all enter that party. But that's an invitation that is made for you today. Like, we can enter into the celebration today, and we can live life in that celebration with our Father. In that kind of a relationship. Today, and every day, until he returns. That's what he wants for you. That's what I want for you. That's what your teachers and your pastors and your chaplain wants for you. The question is, do you want that for you? I hope and pray today you will say yes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for showing us who you are. Thank you for showing us that you are a God who is so good and so loving that you would tear up your own life, give up your own son for us. Thank you, Jesus, for being our faithful and true older brother who has gone out to find us no matter where we have gone. You were willing to pay the price. You were willing to pay the cost. Lord, let us today say yes to you. Let us today say yes to the life of faith, of the life and the way of trust. Let us enter into the celebration that is in your presence today and let us experience that joy each and every day of our lives. Thank you, God, for who you are and for what you've done and that the, in the ways that you have led us and are inviting us in. I pray, God, that we may move forward and enter into your feast and celebration today. In your name we pray. It's hard to believe I 
my time to go, but before I leave, go and tell the world about me. I was dead, but now I live. I've gotta go now for a little. Goodbye's not the end Don't forget the things that I taught you I conquered death and I hold the key And where I go, you will go to someday there's much to do here before you leave. So go and tell the world about me. I was dead, but now I live. I've got to go now for a little. But goodbye is not the end of the journey, the end of the road. My spirit is with you wherever you go. And you have a purpose and I have a plan. I'll make you this promise. I'll come back again. But until then, go and tell the world about me. I was dead, but now I live. I've got to go now for a little while. But goodbye is not the end. But goodbye is not the end. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your love. Thank, thank, thank you for your posture towards us, Lord. Thank you that no matter where we go and how far we go, we know that we have you. Holy Spirit, whatever convictions have been filled and created and are developed right now, Lord, I pray that these would turn into to changes in our lives, Lord. That we would begin to change the way we think about ourselves and other people. That we may change the way we think about who you are. That we may change the way we think about the blessings you offer us. Lord, I pray, God, that you would lead us on the path of trust. Father, thank you for speaking to us this week. I pray, God, that you would help us to move forward and take the next steps in our lives to develop a deep, meaningful relationship with you. One rooted in love. One rooted in trust. Help us no longer try to control you or manipulate you or convince you or demand but let us entrust our entire lives into your hands. God, you are trustworthy, and you are faithful, and you are good. Thank you, Father. Please be with us, be with this GCA family, be with this church, be with all those who are here today, and that may you guide our steps and help us to grow closer to you each and every day. In your name we pray, amen.